Good afternoon, everyone. I am Lynn Vedeca, Dean of the School of Social Work. It's my honor to welcome you to the first of three faculty centennial lecture series. Today's uh, set of lectures is entitled Intervention Research in Mental Health. The session today will focus on intervention innovations for depression and suicide. This, we have had a wonderful lecture series during the centennial. Some of you may have been to some of the earlier lectures, but this fall, it's my special pleasure to, um, be, to include in our series um, faculty from the School of Social Work, from Michigan Social Work, who are conducting cutting edge research to improve social work interventions. Today, we will focus on people struggling with suicidal impulses and depression and innovative interventions for those populations. I'm really pleased to feature this new knowledge being created by Michigan faculty members. I now want to take a moment to introduce today's discussant, Professor Joe Himley. Joe is our Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and the Howard V. Brabson Collegiate Professor of Social Work. He is also a professor of psychiatry at the medical school. Joe will introduce each of the presenting faculty and now I'll turn the podium over to Joe. Great, uh, thank you, Lynn. Again, I'm Joe Himley, a faculty member here at the school, Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs. I'm also the uh, co-director of the Treatment Innovation and Dissemination Research Group here at the school. Uh, this group includes faculty members, doctoral students, master's students, and a range of staff who work together on, a, on intervention related projects in the area of mental health and health and mental health. So super excited to be here. It's a landmark for our school to have so much to say about mental health intervention research and new ideas on how to, how to both spread intervention as well as to improve interventions. So it's an exciting day for me exciting day for the school and uh, super good to have all these great speakers here today. So our session uh, really does provide examples of community engaged research and multi-level interventions to address and, uh, and reduce suicide risk as well as depression and a focus on diverse uh, communities. The strategies share a range uh, from community level universal prevention to indicated individual psychotherapy. The research targets rural and urban populations and a response to the specific conditions of young black men, Alaska Native communities, rural Michigan communities, and adults with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Uh, this interactive uh, panel presentation will explore the diversity and promise of our current uh, School of Social Work related research in the area of interventions. We certainly have an exciting lineup today. So I'm gonna give a little chance to talk about each of our speakers, a very brief uh, discussion today, but our first speaker uh, who's gonna be talking about macro levels, uh, uh, macro level strategies to prevent suicide is Lisa Wexler. Uh, as you can see, there's Lisa's bio, but a few highlights. She is a professor of social work here at the school and also at the Institute for Social Research here at the University of Michigan. Her, her research focuses on suicide prevention, wellness, and learning. Um, she, her research engages participants in all levels of the process, responds to cultural and community priorities, and builds on and promotes personal and collective assets. She's working on several projects, uh, including a project uh, called Promoting Community Conversations About Research and Suicide, and that is a community partnership and academic uh, collaboration. And in addition, she's working on a project involving intergenerational dialogue and exchange to engage young people in efforts to find local strengths, skills, and wisdom across generational and community-based interventions, investigations. Um, Lisa is a terrific collaborator and uh, excited to have her here. Our second presenter is Daphne Watkins. She is uh, the diversity and social transformation professor here at the University of Michigan and the director of the Vivian A. and James L. Curtis School of Social Work uh, Center for Health Equity Research and Training. 
Uh, Dr. Watkins' research focuses on behavioral interventions for historically marginalized groups, uh, mixed method approaches to research in context, and leadership development and structures. Uh, her research aims to maximize human potential, elevate social experiences, and provide an equitable impact in communities and organizations. She's a community practitioner, strengths-based perspective, and she is the founding director of the Gender and Health Research Lab and uh, the Certificate Program in Mixed Methods Research and the award-winning Young Black Men, Masculinities and Mental Health Project, or affectionately called YB Men. So, and uh, Daphne will be talking about physical distance and social connections, reducing depression among young Black men. Hear all about that, it'll be great. Our next presenter, also from the School of Social Work is Addie Weaver. Addie is a, an assistant professor of social work here at the school. Uh, her work uh, focuses on increasing access to mental health interventions for underserved, economically div uh, disadvantaged individuals and families with a special focus on uh, care, mental health care in rural communities. She also uses epidemiologic data, data to better understand the prevalence and causes of mental illness in rural communities. Uh, Addie's uh, Professor Weaver's ultimate goal is to uh, improve the quality of life for rural residents with mental health needs. And she's gonna be talking about a technology focused intervention to help people in rural areas uh, called Raising Our Spirits Together. Looking forward to that. And our final presenter is Lindsay Bornheimer. She is also assistant professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Michigan. In addition, she is a, an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry in the Medical School. Uh, Professor Bornheimer's research program focuses on understanding and preventing suicide death, uh, particularly among adults experiencing serious mental illness. She has a specific focus on suicidality among people with psychosis and schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Um, she focuses on suicide risk and protective factors and uh, is particularly interested in intervention and implementation work, work in this area. She has particular expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy, and she is focused on the adaption and implementation of cognitive behavioral approaches to the treatment of serious mental illness and in suicide prevention. She's a clinical social worker with lots of uh, direct practice experience as well. And uh, Lindsay's gonna be talking about uh, cognitive behavior therapy intervention for suicide in the treatment of adults with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So that is uh, an esteemed group of colleagues, excited to hear what they have to say. Uh, at the end of the session, I'll serve as a discussant, just offering a few comments in general on what we've heard. Then there will be a question and answer period where you'll all get a chance to submit your questions. And again, we have both a Q&A as well as a, a chat to, uh, uh, to put your questions in. And I'll be trying to take a look at them as, as we go. So that's enough for me. Now we can begin with Professor Lisa Wexler. So, oofla lotak, I am going to share my screen, I think. Let's see. All right. I think we're in business now. So I'm going to talk about macro level strategies. We'll start really broad and we'll move into um, different layers of prevention activities and intervention that is happening. Um, to begin, I use she, her pronouns. I'm a mother of three, and I come to you after decades of research, community-engaged research in rural and remote communities, mostly in the Arctic and mostly indigenous. So I'm going to be sharing some of the learning that I've done and that we've done together um, to sort of broaden some of our thinking about suicide prevention, both in terms of what can be done and where we can move the field in the future. So I'm going to start off by talking about the scope of the problem of suicide um, with a special emphasis on youth suicide. Um, we'll move into thinking about it in the United States, which is where we are. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about Alaska because we have a lot to learn from Alaska and some of the issues that I'll be framing for you that take place in the United States are bigger issues in Alaska as many things are. So this is our first poll question. Um, for what age group is suicide a leading cause of death? 
So you should now have a poll question up. And if you're looking for CEUs, please make sure to answer this question. I'm gonna give a couple minutes. So when it goes away, I think I'll know that you all have selected your, what age group is suicide a leading cause of death for? Okay, so there was a mix of responses and the answer was a little bit of a trick question is all of them. Um, so for the US, um, people ages 10 through 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death and that's in fairly recent um, data. It's the second leading cause of death for young people ages 15 to 29 globally. And um, it is a critical health problem that is not actually getting better over time. So this slide shows data starting from the top 2002 to 2004. And that dark red is um, higher rates of suicide. So as you can see over time um, that that red is growing and if we look at the most rural parts of our country is where that issue is most pronounced. The other thing that we know about suicide rates is that they are rising among younger people, among people of color and among girls. Still boys are at highest risk, but girls are growing faster than other populations. Rural populations, their rates are growing higher and firearms are involved in half of the suicide deaths. So what factors do you think contribute to these rising suicide rates in the US? And you'll see that all of my photos are from rural Alaska. This is Kotzebue. You should be getting your second poll. And this is my last poll, but you'll get polls throughout. So what factors contribute to the rising suicide rates in the US? And again, this is for younger people, people of color and girls. And this might be a spoiler because I'm seeing that the poll is still there. Um, but dun, 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 the answer is all of the above, um, which many of you thought. So suicide is a really complex problem um, that intersects with many things that have to do with policies, marginalization in the communities that I work with. Youth suicide is now a, a leading cause of death, but it is a new one and really um, started being do documented at the time of colonization. And so in the last 50 years is when youth suicide um, became a problem. Before that, many elders talk about how that was not even an issue. So many of the colonial policies, the new institutions, the economic practices that were imposed on the communities that I work with have created um, a very complex experience for young people, um, different ideas of the future and meaningful pathways to walk into it. It has created many different kinds of community stress um, with nuclear families being sort of the assumed reality when many of the communities that um, the families within communities that I work with are multi-generational housing issues when settlements, meaning living in one place year round is a new experience for many people. And we try and shrink all of these, all of this complexity into a psychological disorder. Um, Amy Barnhart wrote a great um, sort of opinion piece on this in the New York Times, I definitely recommend it, to be looking at um, 
suicide through a bigger lens. And really what that can do for us is it opens up many new possibilities for prevention when we move it outside of just a psychological problem, but move it into communities, into policies, and to think creatively about how we can begin to address multi-level stress and factors that influence this outcome. Ooh, sorry about that. So much of the suicide intervention in the United States is really geared towards crisis intervention. So this red arrow signifies this very high critical moment when someone's thinking about suicide or taking action about it. Um, and really, um, we know that the groups that are growing most rapidly and the highest risk groups don't have easy access to mental health services. And we'll hear about some of the interventions that are being done by Addie Weaver, um, among others, to begin to address this. Um, and much of that care, when it is accessible, is maybe not culturally responsive. Um, nine out of 10 of Alaska Native youth, when referred to mental health services, refuse that treatment, even when they are being referred because of suicidal behavior. The other thing to note, and many of you, it looks like our clinicians, um, is that we don't do a lot of training in many mental health providers um, training programs um, for suicide specific um, interventions. So um, when we look across prevention programs, only about 50% of mental health providers are getting suicide specific training. And that training typically is less than four hours. So much of our infrastructure for suicide prevention is looking at this indicated level, this very crisis intervention level of suicide prevention. Um, and then we're referring to mental health services. And many times those services are either culturally questionable um, in that it's, it's really hard to um, provide services in many areas. Um, and oftentimes, families and communities find that those services are not culturally responsive in ways that, um, that you know, allow them to seek that help continuously. Um, and the providers don't have a lot of training in that service. Another thing to note is rural communities. And when we saw the United States, we saw how rural communities were suffering from suicide um, disproportionately. When we look at Alaska, that that disproportionality becomes even greater. So access to care is even harder. When we look at the service system for Alaska, so you could see in that last slide how big Alaska is. It's definitely the biggest state. Um, and when we look at the service systems, this is a, um, a diagram showing you the air miles that need to be traveled to access care. This central hub in, in the state at the bottom is like going from North Dakota down to Oklahoma for care. And our psychiatric inpatient facilities are only found in two places in the state. Um, and many times it involves three plane rides to get to those facilities. Um, even the regional clinics about, so the region that I'm most familiar with is Northwest Alaska. It's up in this area. Um, and that is about the size of Indiana, and people have to travel by air to get to crisis intervention services. So that's an important thing to remember when we're thinking of a crisis only or putting a lot of our, our eggs in just crisis intervention for suicide prevention. So in addition to that, I'm going to advocate here for trying to do more community-based family-based type interventions that involves multiple sectors of the community in universal prevention and selective prevention so that we are able to reduce suicide risk and increase protection. And what that can mean, it can look like a lot of different things. I'm going to draw from my experience in Alaska Native rural communities where I've been encouraged again and again to move from just thinking about risk identification and reduction to wellness and protection. Um, so how can we move um, 
into thinking about what works to protect young people, um, what works to uplift and support them in a multitude of ways, economically, socially, academically, in ways that help them feel like they have opportunities for the future, that help them manage anxiety and stress, that help their families um, support them. And so this is um, just an example of a um, piece of educational material that we've created to really look at um, youth development and protective factors for youth wellness. We get folks together to be thinking about what they can do to develop hope, um, increase learning, make sure that institutions that young people are going to every day, like schools, have some um, relevance, know what is important in the lives of young people, bring in elders and other community members to help teach young people what they need to move forward in their lives. What else can we do? So oftentimes we, when we're thinking about suicide prevention, we spend a lot of time funding and thinking about the why. Why do people commit suicide? Why is um, suicide death a problem for certain groups of people more than others? And I really want us to also be thinking about how, because if we understand how and when and where, we can begin to take steps that are tangible, that everyone can do um, to make either their homes safer at different times of year. There might be different risks that we can think about to think about the geography of suicide that typically is ignored when we talk about this subject. And so this is yet another educational piece of material that we've created for Alaska Native communities. This home is Alaska. Um, many of the housing looks like this. But there are many things that we can do, including thinking about the when in a um, seasonal patterns um, are really pronounced in the Arctic. And we know that impulsivity and suicide um, are one of those things that are correlated. We know that young people, when they get less sleep, um, tend to be more impulsive. And we know that there's more youth suicidal behavior in the summer, thus the sun blocking blinds, for instance. So we can use what we know about the environment, what we know are local risks, and we can work with community members to try and figure out what we can do about those risks to increase protection. We can also think about the informal helping systems that are already in place in communities. This is particularly important in communities that have been marginalized, that don't have a lot of formal access to professional care. Um, and when we talk to young people in the regions that I work, they are most likely to be going to family members and to friends rather than um, professionals to get their all kinds of needs met. So can we think about how to bring people together that are already in the lives of young people to work together to learn from evidence um, what they can do to make their environment safer, to reach out to young people, um, to support them in ways that have evidence behind them. And that's what we're doing with promoting community conversations about research um, to end suicide. We can also build on local knowledge systems and community knowledge um, to begin to reduce suicide risk. And so what we've done with this particular intervention is to bring people together from multiple sectors of community that includes law enforcement, it includes tribal leadership, it includes school and mental health providers, it includes community health workers and primary care providers to come together. We have all kinds of CEUs and other kinds of incentives to do this for work and, and to learn a little bit about research. So I told you about the seasonal trends that we see in suicidality in the communities that I work. And you can see this graph to the left shows that seasonal pattern where we see young people in particular are, do, are enacting more suicidal behavior in the summertime when there is 100% light. Um, people sort of anecdotally know this sometimes. Um, we have a lot of different theories for why that is. I shared one with you about sleep. And I got that theory from hosting these community conversations where people from the local community came together, looked at this data, and made sense of it in particular ways. 
So in this case, um, when we see young people don't have school in the summer, oftentimes families are at camp doing subsistence activities. So many, many times, um, either tribal leaders have created um, culture camps to make sure that young people have some um, structured mentored activities to do in the summer. Um, other times, parents who have attended these sessions have made sure that they're going to bring their teenagers, like it or not, with them when they go to camp to do these activities. So bringing people together to brainstorm, to utilize research in ways that work for them is a way to bring both research knowledge together with local and cultural knowledge so that people can put it to use in their lives. And that's what we've been doing with PC Cares. Um, so really our intention then is to bring people together to start working on multi-level prevention where we can begin to build policies, build institutions that affirm different cultural and local realities that provide services and training to folks who are coming from outside the community so that they better understand the realities that local people are living under and with and the cultural ways in which they interpret those. Um, we bring community leaders together to help frame and create programs that make sense. Um, we really work with local families to figure out what kinds of resources and support they need. Um, and then we help to facilitate that. We teach people how to create different kinds of opportunities. Um, we help professionals figure out different ways of framing what they're doing so that they can be more responsive to local needs and understandings and to create opportunities that make sense for young people. And that is the end of my presentation. This, um, all of this knowledge has come with a lot of um, help from a lot of people and a lot of institutions. Um, and I think Daphne is gonna talk about a really innovative um, program that she's been working on as an intervention for young black men. Thank you, Lisa. All right, let me share my screen here. We should all be experts with the sharing of the screen by now, right? We can only hope. All right, hopefully folks can see this. All right, fantastic. So it is a pleasure to be here today to get us launched with our Centennial Lecture Series. So um, as Jill mentioned, the title of my talk is Physical Distance, Social Connection, Reducing Depression Among Young Black Men with the YB Men Project. So over the next few minutes, I think I wanna take you on a journey where we Recognize, describe, acknowledge, and explore. We are going to begin by recognizing the mental health challenges of Black men. We will then move to describe the ways that masculinities and social support impact the lives of Black men. Then we will acknowledge the importance of considering mental health, masculinities, and social support when working with Black men. And then finally explore how the YB Men Project promotes mental health, and it promotes progressive masculinities and social support for Black men. And I will provide uh, a lot more information about all of these in just the next few slides. But first, I want to begin by setting a tone. Because for those of us who've been studying men of color, particularly Black men, we've known that even before the pandemic began, there were challenges in our communities and among our uh, Black men, both in the communities and educational settings and healthcare settings. But what we've learned is that the pandemic has just brought on these additional challenges. And so in, in many of the writings of colleagues now, we're talking about dual pandemics. We're talking about, in addition to, to COVID-19, there is this issue of safety around how do Black men in particular feel about wearing masks? And so uh, the center article is one that I found really provocative that came out uh, in 2020, uh, talking about the fact that masks are supposed to keep us all safe, but what does that mean? What are the implications for Black men who wear masks and potentially posing as threats to their community members, their, their um, people with whom they interact? And so it's something that 
you know, several gender and racial groups don't have to really think about. But for men who may already appear to be intimidating to some groups, this was the these were the conversations that were happening among these communities. And so I just want to begin by just setting some tone about what does it mean to experience the things that many of the, of the Black men in our communities experience in addition to wearing a mask, which should be for a safety issue or safety reason, um, but how they can present themselves to others who may not know them. And so I wanna start with a poll question. So this is the first one. What is the life expectancy for black men in the United States? So I'll just wait a couple of seconds and let you all choose your responses. All right, hopefully people have selected their responses. So if you selected 68 years, you are correct. So what's really interesting is that some recent data, actually some reports that came out in early 2021 reported on data from 2020 that showed that the life expectancy for black men in the United States has actually decreased. Uh, over the past couple of years. And so for a while they were sort of just grazing 70, but now has gone back down to 68 over the past few years. In actuality, 75 years is the average life expectancy for white men, 76 is for Hispanic men, and 80 is just a number I threw in there to, to trip you up a little bit. So when we think about life expectancy for black men being 68 years old, I mean, to me, that is a sobering, number. And just to start with some other sobering statistics, and uh, forgive me because I will start here, but I promise I will not end with sobering statistics. But just to get us started here, Black men on average live seven years less than other racial groups. They tend to have higher death rates than women for all leading causes of death. When it comes to feelings of anxiety or depression, Black men between the ages of 18 and 44 are less likely to report any feelings around anxiety and depression, and they're also less likely to seek help for their mental health challenges. For Black men who have been diagnosed with HIV AIDS, they're five times more likely to die from that. And then suicide is the third leading cause of death for Black men ages 15 to 24. And so again, just setting the stage and being as transparent as I possibly can about what we're up against when we're talking about preserving the lives of our Black men. Um, and that can definitely begin from when they're Black boys, but what does that look like over the life course? And speaking of life course, this is your second poll question. What social determinants of Black men's mental health are included in research on their life course? So I'll just pause for a couple of seconds and give you all a chance to respond. What social determinants of black men's mental health are included in research on their life course? Okay, so hopefully by now you have a selection and very much like my colleague Lisa, this was kind of a trick question. Because in, in an interesting sort of turn of events when it comes to research on Black men's life course, there's not a lot of research being done on the life course for Black men at all. Very, very limited. Um, I myself have done some conceptual work looking at what does the adult life course for Black and African American men look like as we think about depression and as we think about mood disorders. And so this is a model that I published a few years ago, really trying to understand what are those social determinants and what's the context and in what spaces are we seeing these Black men who may be young in terms of age, middle adulthood and older, what are they dealing with? Where are the places for intervention as they're going through this young adulthood stage where they're experiencing differences that they acknowledge within themselves, their family and their friends. And this young adulthood stage is definitely the place where they feel like they're becoming who they are. They're becoming the person that they want to be. 
And young adult, by the way, is, is typically 18 to 30. So this middle adult category is typically 31 to 54. And during that stage of, of, of adulthood, that's where they're really sort of beginning to experience firsthand this workplace stress, discrimination, life changes, you know, partnering up and maybe having kids, getting the 2.5, you know, kids in the house and the picket fence. And then as they get older, which is actually 55 and older for Black men, that's when they begin to experience retirement, fixed income. But also in some of my field work with, with Black men, they talk about, you know, the death of their friends and their family members, because again, life expectancy is 68. So, um, you know, I often talk with colleagues about what does that older category look like? And, you know, a lot of people didn't realize they were in that older men category. But when you think about such a low life expectancy or limited life expectancy is actually for Black men, I'm a lot sooner and a lot more traumatic, you know, um, compared to other racial and ethnic groups. So now let me talk a little bit about the pillars of the work that I do. So I have three pillars, mental health, masculinities, and I'll say in a second why that's plural, and social support. So exactly what do I mean by mental health? Well, I tend to be guided by the biopsychosocial bio, uh, model of mental health, which looks at sort of the biological aspects, the social aspects, and the psychological aspects. So it's a very complex definition of how we look at mental health. When it comes to masculinities, I use masculinities in the plural sense because it's really guided by this idea that there's not just one way to be masculine. And that's often the message that we send our boys and young men, either you're a man or you're not. Instead of really thinking about masculinities as being on a continuum and that over the course of one's life, they could be you know, far further down one end of the continuum compared to the other end of the continuum. And so a lot of this work on masculinities is really trying to open up the possibilities of progressive masculinities and how that intersects with health and mental health for Black men and boys. And then when it comes to social support, this is a grossly under-researched area when you think about the work that's currently being done with Black men and boys. And so social support, um, mainly from friends, from family, from classmates and such, and in, in this case, um, based on the photo, you see these guys are in college. You know, it's one of those um, areas that while there's been some preliminary work done, we still really don't understand what are the indicators that promote social support among Black men, and also what are the implications for social support with regard to mental health outcomes. So I'm often asked the question, why the focus on Black men? And I will save you the story about my personal connections to this work, but instead focus on what the promise is and the potential is around intervention. And so the work that we do around Black men is really looking at the fact that their transitions to adulthood are often associated with this heightened awareness, this realization that despite the rules that they're trying to follow, despite trying to walk the straight and narrow and do what's being told of them, they are going to still face so many challenges along the way, you know, face so many ceilings and restrictions and roadblocks to achieving their life goals. And so particularly for young Black men in these spaces and these communities, it's really a wonderful opportunity to intervene. And so that's why we have decided to do so. And so enter the Young Black Men, Mas I'm sorry, Young Black Men, Masculinities and Mental Health Project, or the YB Men Project for short. Now, this is a project that began a few years ago. And the focus of the project is really on three core pillars, transforming gender norms, improving mental health, and expanding, um, I'm sorry, transforming gender norms, improving mental health, and increasing social support. And so we're really trying to expand definitions of manhood. We're trying to improve Black men's mental health. And we're also trying to get them to uh, normalize this idea of seeking help when help is needed. And so the pilot work was done in 2014, right here in the state of Michigan. And since then, we've been visiting several college campuses, as well as middle schools and high schools. And we just launched an intervention in Australia. We just launched some work in Australia to do an intervention that really build on these three pillars. 
And so the goal all along is just to think about how are we transforming these ideas and these identities for men so that we can have uh, better mental health outcomes, more expansive definitions of, of manhood, and increased social support. So this is all evidence-based work. And it's based on some conceptual work that I've been doing for the past, I guess, 15 or so years, really looking at what are the indicators and what are the factors that truly impact these men's lives. And so the conceptual framework for the YB Men Project is really an integration of social cognitive theory and theories of social networks and social support. I won't get into too much detail about the theory, but I have a very dense theory paper that I can refer people to if they're so moved and so interested to do the work. But I just wanted to show that, you know, it's really about thinking about how these various factors um, intersect and then how are they truly impacting not just the experiences of these men with regard to mental health, but also some of their behaviors and how can we then intervene with behavioral interventions. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of our most recent iterations of the YB Men Project. And I wanna begin with talking about eligibility criteria. So to date, we have enrolled black men who fit these three items here. They have been less likely to discuss sensitive topics face-to-face. -face. We tend to reach out to men whose distress has not yet reached clinical severity. And then finally, who are open to having conversations about mental health, manhood, and social support in a private social media setting. Um, and for those who noticed, I have a little star by number two, because in previous iterations of the YB Men Project, we have only um, included men who did not have the kind of distress or a psychological distress that was sort of at the clinical threshold, but we're actually opening up our eligibility criteria to start including more of those men in future iterations of the program. So when people ask me, what exactly is YB Men? What is the process that you take people through to go through the experience? This is actually one of the diagrams that I showed them. So this is an intervention. And so we begin with our pretest that includes baseline interviews or focus groups and a survey. We then, of course, provide them with a small uh, cash incentive. They can opt in or out of the YB Men program. And then after that, after the program is completed, we run them through another round of pre of, uh, post test um, surveys and focus groups or interviews, um, after which they receive another cash incentive, and then we wrap things up. Now, our most recent iteration was done um, at a couple of local colleges here. I'm saying local. I'm thinking Midwest when I say local. Um, I will not mention the names because I know there are some heavy football fans on the line, so I won't mention the universities that we worked with. But we were able to reach out to about 350 Black men in these settings, and we had them complete our first survey. Of that group, about 40 self-selected into the YB Men program. And so we pulled those 40 men out and asked them to actually participate in the full-blown intervention. So for those who want to know a little bit about the content, the nuts and bolts of YB Men, it's really a social media grounded intervention that uses popular culture references to educate Black men and boys about mental health, about uh, masculinities and about social support. But as you can imagine, especially in this current climate, issues come up, topics come up around racial identity, around anti-racism and safety and policing. And so it's really an amazing opportunity to have some protected uh, and safe spaces for these guys to exchange and, and, and commune with, with one another about what's happening around them. And so it's really a, a unique opportunity to pull in some popular culture references from music, from art, from sports, um, even from movies, and uh, really have some critical conversations, if you will, within these social media communities about what's happening and how uh, they start to sort of revisit their own value systems and how they plan to address some of their own challenges as they're going through life. So this is just a sample seven-week curriculum. And as you can see along the left side of the screen, we have the different week's topics there. 
And each week has a theme and we tend to guide them through these social media exchanges where we usually begin with sharing content with them, uh, getting them to react to us. But trust me, by the end of the weeks, they're actually sharing their own content and coming up with their own original material, which is a really rewarding experience for the team. So what do the YB Men participants experience? What exactly do they go through? Well, again, this program is delivered via social media. And so whether they have an iPad or a cell phone, they're able to access either through Facebook or through Instagram, whatever the platform is that we're using for that particular iteration, the program in and of itself. So we post YouTube videos, we post clips, uh, music song lyrics, and we really dive deeply into the meaning of that and how they can interpret what's happening with those song lyrics, with those clips. We make connections to depression, to stress, to anxiety. We talk about diagnoses. We talk about uh, all different types of things, in, um, as, as you can imagine. And so it's really a unique experience, I think. Something else that I want to say while I'm on this slide is that oftentimes when I'm working with uh, colleagues who say, you know, how do you get men to talk about mental health? How, how do you get them to communicate with you about mental health? I try to talk to my dad. I try to talk to my brother and they don't say anything about mental health. Well, trust me, a few prompts in a private and protected space, and I could hardly get these guys to stop communicating. And so I think the question is not um, will they talk? I think the question is, what do we need to do to encourage that support and that enriching exchange around topics that they care about? And so just a few results here before I begin to wrap up. Um, I just want to share that those three pillars of the YB Men Project and of my work, mental health, manhood, and social support, has really brought us to a place where we're seeing changes in time. So the two measures that we use for mental health are the PHQ-9, um, and I know there are quite a few clinicians on the line, so you may recognize that measure, but we also use a lesser known measure called the Gotland Male Depression Scale, and it's really popular over in the UK, uh, but I actually like to use both of these measures because, you know, the PHQ-9 is pretty popular, pretty familiar. And ask questions like, do you feel blue? Do you feel sad? Do you feel like everything's an effort? The Gotland male depression scale is one that uses what we would call more sort of masculine or language that tends to lean more to the kind of thing, the kind of way that men and boys would talk about their mental health. You know, asking questions about feeling irritated or agitated or angry or frustrated. So it really provides, I think, between the PHQ-9 and the Gotland, a nice scope of you know, how are we asking them about uh, depression? How are we asking them about depressive symptoms? But then also how are they responding to that? And what we have found from the YB Men Project from, and I'm just gonna focus on the top part of this table here, that when it comes to before and after the intervention, we're seeing the kind of results that we want to see. And that is we want to see their depressive symptoms decrease. And so the blue bar, are the results from the PHQ-9. You'll see that the scores have decreased um, from before to after the intervention. And then also with the Gotland male depression scale, we're also seeing some changes in time that are statistically significant. So we're really thrilled about that. And so for the folks who uh, are not so keen on the stats and the regression models and the bar charts. It's very simple that, you know, thanks to some of the work we've been doing with YB men, we have been able to witness for young black men, their depressive symptoms decrease, their progressive masculinities or positive masculinities increase. We're beginning to expand their definitions beyond those of their grandfathers and their fathers. And we're also seeing so many men uh, seek social support. In fact, some of our post-tests and some of our follow-up after the intervention, uh, we were able to work with men and actually talk with them about how even after the research team from YB Men has left and we've you know, sort of left the, the space and moved on, that they will start their own groups, their own support groups, their own connections with guys because they have found it helpful to actually have other guys that they can convene with. 
But for those who know me, uh, people know that I'm a mixed methods researcher. And so I also value the voices and want to uplift the voices of our participants. And so some of the quotes that they've given us, uh, just include them here as I begin to wrap up. So when we've asked guys about manhood or about masculinities, uh, one gentleman said, from my personal experience, I think Black men's experience with masculinity is more severe than some other cultures. I feel like other cultures, especially white cultures, are more likely to talk about counseling and getting professional help or talking to a therapist with their children growing up versus in the Black community. It's like, no, you deal with it. You go deal with it on your own. You don't let things that happen in your family get outside that family. And so one of the things that we're really proud about with the YB Men Project is our ability to help break down these barriers and really normalize seeking help, not just for men in general, but for Black men, really providing a culture for support and culturally tailored kinds of support that we can provide them over the course of their journeys. And then when it comes to the interventions, um, the the intervention results around stress. A lot of our guys tell us that stress is just different for Black men in the United States and particularly for the Black men in their communities. You know, one guy said they call stress the silent killer that will build up and that eats away at you over time. Also, in a land where you're supposed to be able to do things such as protest freely in a peaceful manner, you have people saying you can't do this. We see other people getting away with other types of activities and not being punished for it. So a lot of the guys within this private group are just processing their reactions to the world around them, to protests that are happening around the racial injustices of our country. And so they talk about how they don't have an opportunity to really be candid in other spaces, but they're able to do that in the YB Men Project. And then finally, one of our last questions in every YB Men iteration is, how did you like it? You know, we're always trying to make it better. We're always trying to figure out, you know, how do we improve the mousetrap? How do we uh, create something that we can reach more guys with? And so one participant said, what you guys are doing, the actual program and trying to spread awareness about mental health to Black men, I think it's really good. And another participant said, the YB Men group was definitely a safe space where you could talk about your ideas as Black men, talk about your opinions on things without judgment, without backlash. Because this was a private group, only we could see what we were saying. It just felt good. And it showed me what having a social support group would be like. And so just as I begin to think about what does expansion look like and what are some of the outcomes that maybe we weren't anticipating early on, but we're starting to see now, you know, we're starting to see mental health literacy increase. We're starting to see um, more security around racial identity and gender identity. So there are just other outcomes that are uh, becoming very apparent from the work that we're able to do by providing these spaces for Black men to process mental health, masculinity, and social support. And so we're really proud of our uh, previous sites. Um, and you'll see from this diagram that we've been able to not only do some work in Michigan and Ohio, but we just recently launched a YB Men project in, Northern, in the Northern Territory of Australia. We're gonna have an opportunity to work with Aboriginal and Indigenous men in Australia. And we're really excited about that. We've worked primarily with college campuses, but what's really interesting is whenever we do have a chance to sit down and talk with black college men about mental health, manhood and social support, uh, hands down, the majority of the guys tell us this information is fantastic, but I wish I would have gotten it when I was younger. I wish I would have received more education about mental health, manhood and social support when I was in high school or when I was in middle school. So as a result, we are beginning to reduce our age eligibility for YB men and starting to do more work in middle schools and high schools in the area. So just YB men by the numbers. We have been so fortunate over the past six or seven years to have a reach of about 500 men who know about YB men, have our t-shirts, have our swag. They've met our team, they connect with us. We've been able to do the actual intervention with over 100 black men and boys. 
And then about 92% of them have actively participated in the program. So this is really an important number because sometimes you can create something amazing, but nobody participates. And so we're really proud of our high participation rates. We've been to about six college campuses so far, but as I mentioned, we're just now starting to do some work in younger groups, such as high school and middle school, and then also having a global reach in Australia. And in that last bubble there, looking at the average number of points depression scores have decreased between baseline and the post YBMN program is really important. For the clinicians on the line, you know, I mean, any way that we can move the needle is very important when it comes to depression scales and measures. And so we're really pleased about that as well. So for those of you who are interested in following us and um, doing a little bit more digging into what I've presented today and want to see the research side of it, we do have some scientific, uh, scientific articles that we've published over the past few years. If you're interested in the more public facing documents, we do have some reports that are available on our website. And so you're able to view more of our work there. And with that, I'll go ahead and say thank you to all of our funders, our sponsors, and I would never be able to speak to 162 people without saying, if the spirit moves you and you ever want to give um, to the YBMN Project, there is an opportunity to do that on the website at ybmnproject.com. We always are open to um, taking donations because this work is so important. And we want to make sure that all the boys who want to receive the program are able to receive it. So with that, I will go ahead and... Thank everyone again and pass the mic to my colleague, Addie. Thank you so much, Daphne. Um, just as my colleagues have shared, it's really wonderful to be part of this first centennial series focused on mental health. And I've also really appreciated learning more about the wonderful work um, that Lisa and Daphne's groups are doing. Um, and so now um, I'd like to turn our attention to um, a project that community members and myself um, and team have been working on focused on um, really facilitating community engagement and leveraging technology to increase access to depression treatment in rural Michigan and specifically share with you some pilot findings of Raising Our Spirits Together and Entertaining Technology-Assisted Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Depression that we've tailored for rural adults and for delivery by local clergy. And so to get us started, um, I'd like to share a little bit about why the focus on rural areas and some of the um, mental health treatment access disparities that rural residents face um, that in my view are, you know, really a social justice issue that requires attention. Um, and so as you can see here, there's kind of three domains that we think about within these treatment access disparities in the rural context. One is availability of mental health professionals. So again, many of you here today have um, experience practicing as social workers, our clinicians, and so this may not be a surprise to you, but 60% of rural counties actually don't have a practicing social worker, psychologist, or psychiatrist. So as you can imagine, not having a local resource or connection is um, a real deterrent to help seeking and also has significant implications for the accessibility of mental health treatment. So we know that in rural areas, it's much more difficult to get places. So there isn't an infrastructure for public transportation. The communities that I've been working in here in Michigan, um, you know, you don't just call an Uber or a Lyft. Um, that's not an option. And so things that, you know, are um, sometimes taken for granted in suburban and urban contexts just aren't available in, in some of these rural settings. Um, and folks often have to rely on their own personal transportation if they're going to um, um, be able to access treatment and have to drive substantial distances, um, you know, to make that happen. And that's just not feasible for some folks. Additionally, the cost um, and under insurance or uninsured status um, that impact many rural Americans um, still remain an access barrier. Even with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we're still seeing disparities in rural folks um, are not 
um, having insurance coverage as, at the same rates as urban residents. Additionally, acceptability is a big issue um, in rural communities, as it is in many underrepresented um, groups. In the rural context specifically, there is a documented preference for talking about mental health needs in close-knit circles, so maybe with the family and the friends. So as Dr. Watkins mentioned with her work with Black men, you know, and, and some of the participants talking about wanting to keep that discussion in the family, we often hear that same sentiment shared among rural residents as well especially because folks in rural areas, although they're geographically isolated, there's typically a close-knit social network. So folks know each other. So some people in rural areas have kind of described it as living life in a fishbowl where everyone knows what everyone else is doing or you know, kind of gets in, in one another's business. Um, and so there's this idea that there's a lack of anonymity. And so if you're going to go to maybe the only mental health treatment option in town, which is often the community mental health center that might be in the county, someone might see your car in the parking lot and recognize it. Or you might go in and the administrative person checking you in that day is your cousin's really good friend. And so there's a, a real concern kind of about not being able to um, have that disclosure or being able to keep things um, kind of close to the best around mental health in rural areas. And so as a result, we also see a preference for getting mental health care from clergy in rural areas, feeling like, um, you know, again, family, friends, clergy, clergy are more acceptable options for seeking care. And so um, similarly to my colleagues, I'm going to ask you to consider a couple of poll questions. The first one, I'm asking you to think about kind of broadly across the United States, what percentage of US adults living with a mental health need do not receive treatment? And so kind of take your best guess in terms of um, what you think that disparity looks like nationally. We'll give everybody just a few more seconds to put in their, their best guess. All right, so again, um, not sure if this is surprising to folks who are working in this space or not, um, but what we found is that actually more than half of adults. Um, oh, some of you thought things were actually more dire than they are. So that's good. It's not quite as bad as almost half of you thought, but still very bad and requires significant attention, which is why, you know, we're all on here today and really caring about um, this work. So what we find that, you know, more than half, 56% of U.S. adults living with a mental health need do not receive treatment. Um, and so we know that this has significant negative implications across a variety of life domains for these folks. And it's really critical to connect people to treatment in a way that is accessible and acceptable. We also know that in rural areas, we just talked about, there's sort of some added layers of barriers that have to be considered. And so um, our second poll question focuses specifically in the rural context and what percentage of rural residents in the US do you think live in designated mental health provider shortage areas? So these are um, HRSA designated areas where they're actually looking at ratios of the population to providers and um, kind of making a determination at the federal government level that we have shortages or an insufficient number of providers to meet the need in particular areas. And so, you know, we see again, um, that there is, is really, um, you know, a, a, a really big public health concern here um, because 60% of rural residents live in designated mental health provider shortage areas. Um, and so I hope you had a chance to go ahead and answer. And the majority of you um, did get that question um, correct. So again, you know, um, we just want to have an awareness of the realities of this disparity, of these disparities, um, so that we can be thinking critically about action that we can take and advocacy that we can do to help address these needs. 
And so in um, my own community-based work, um, I've really focused on two distinct complementary strategies to try to bridge this gap in a small way in Michigan. Um, and again, many of you who are working in the state understand that although a lot of times folks from outside of Michigan, when they think of our state, think of Detroit, um, the auto industry, maybe Motown, kind of some of those deep connections there, um, really the majority of our state is rural. And so it seems like there's sometimes a disconnect about how Michigan is perceived and some of the realities um, of the context of our state. Um, and so in order to think about addressing some of these rural mental health disparities, um, my team has really focused on deep community-based um, participatory research. Um, so engaging with community to identify needs um, and then partnering with community to really think about designing, developing, and testing interventions that work for them and can be um, sustained in these communities. So as Dr. Watkins mentioned, um, it's critical, you know, we can have great interventions that have decades of, of effectiveness research behind them, but if we're not able to spread them, if we're not able to get them into the hands of folks um, in kind of real world community settings, they're not going to be able to have that intended impact. Um, and so our goal has really been to work collaboratively collaboratively with communities to build the capacity um, in those communities so that work can be sustained and resources um, can be made available, you know, longer than just within the context of a research project or partnership. We also have focused on technology-based solutions, um, specifically computer-assisted or technology-assisted assisted intervention models that are available through web-based applications. Um, again, to think about ways to decrease some of the known barriers to care um, and be able to distribute intervention models um, in a more efficient way. And so um, for the last, you know, seven years about, um, I've been engaging with communities in Hillsdale County um, to understand from a variety of stakeholder perspectives and engage um, meaningfully with folks, you know, what are the most pressing needs in the community? Um, you know, as a researcher um, or research team, we can have, you know, what we think is a great idea, but if it's not mapping on to the realities on the ground in a community, it's not going to fly and it's not going to be worth investing the time and energy into. We really need to be, you know, as we all know, you know, as, as social workers, we want to meet people where they are and acknowledge that folks are the experts in their own lives and in their own communities. Um, and so we have been able to engage with um, human service providers, with congregants at two churches, um, with clergy in the Hillsdale County area, and um, residents receiving food bank services to really try to unpack um, community needs and think about community identified solutions to addressing those needs. And so um, our preliminary studies really, again, reinforce the idea that folks in this community um, view depression as a, a big problem. Um, and specifically, human service providers shared with us that they really felt at a loss as to where they could refer folks who were experiencing mild to moderate depressive symptoms that were impairing their ability to function, but um, not representing an acute crisis situation. So they talked about the community mental health having limited funding, you know, only be, being able to support folks when there was an acute crisis or suicidal ideation, um, and that, you know, other potential private practices or university-based um, supports were really far away and just not accessible to a lot of the folks that they were serving. Um, and so what came up through these preliminary studies is, again, the role of clergy as kind of a frontline mental health provider, de facto mental health provider, provi for providing support for folks with depression in these rural communities. Um, and so we really heard a lot from um, the human service providers that, you know, it really seemed like maybe building some additional capacity within the church um, and with clergy could be an effective solution. Um, and so we talked with clergy and there was a real openness and receptivity to build their toolkit 
and be able to offer additional services and resources, not only to their congregants, but to the broader community. Um, and so we surveyed congregants and um, residents rece receiving food bank services, finding fairly high rates of depression prevalence um, among these two groups, about 25% um, in the congreg congregation and about 50% um, positive um, depression screens in the sample of food bank recipients. And also, again, a great receptivity um, to an openness to seeking mental health services through the church setting. Um, and so this really led us on a path to work with community partners and really think about um, the church as a promising setting to increase access to evidence supported mental health care in this rural community. And so again, you know, why the church? I mentioned it a little bit, but what came up often is that if we were able to offer something into the in the church, we'd be able to offer it at no cost and with no need for insurance status. Um, we'd also be able to um, be offering a program in a non-stigmatizing setting. So that idea about the lack of anonymity, some folks talked about, well, if my car is seen in the church parking lot, that might actually be good for my status in the community, as opposed to being worried about being seen in um, the parking lot at a mental health service setting. Again, the facilitation by a preferred informal provider. And then um, we also found that that group-based mental health treatment option would really align with small group programming that clergy are often and providing, um, whether it's through Bible study, whether it's certain, um, you know, prepackaged studies like the Purpose Driven Life that came out maybe 15 years ago or something that spread through many churches. Um, and then also, um, you know, there's been some more focus on health and wellness programming um, being done in churches as well. And so it really seem like some synergy um, on the community side to, to really focus on um, building capacity within the churches to better support depression, the needs, um, the need for depression treatment in their community. And so this resulted in developing Raising Our Spirits Together. And Raising Our Spirits Together is a computer-assisted group cognitive behavioral therapy for depression. It's housed on um, a mental health treatment delivery platform called Enter Team You Well that um, Dr. Himley and I co-developed. The intervention is facilitated by rural clergy, and there's a company workbook to help um, folks guide folks through in-session activities as well as between session action plans and homework. Raising Our Spirits Together is comprised of eight highly engaging sessions. Um, one thing that some of you who have maybe some experience with technology-assisted or computer-based CBT may know um, that it's found to be effective. We know CBT works, right? There's decades of literature showing CBT works and technology-assisted CBT works as well. However, folks don't really engage with it. Um, there's been some significant challenges with, with engagement, and it has to do mainly um, around some key areas. One, um, the existing programs tend to be really text heavy um, and use a lot of jargon. And so they're academic in nature. And when people, you know, kind of go in to use them, it's really easy to start to feel like, well, this really isn't for me because it wasn't really made specifically for them. Um, it's really a one size fits all approach that has been advanced by many of these computer assisted technology assisted treatments. Um, and there isn't the capacity to um, really customize or tailor content for specific client groups, settings, or contexts. And we know that being able to tailor treatment leads to increased engagement and improved outcomes. And so um, we were wanting to be really intentional as we worked with communities to um, make some choices that would hopefully improve engagement and really allow folks to want to, you know, come back to the next treatment session. Um, so one innovation that is included in Raising Our Spirits Together is um, that the program is centered around a character-driven storyline. We have an animated character, Billy, and you'll actually see a clip of Billy in a, in a minute here. Um, and Billy teaches CBT 
And she stars in kind of this retrospective TV show where in each session you sort of see an episode of what happened with Billy when she was experiencing depression in the last year and then receiving some CBT um, to help her manage that depression. And so Raising Our Spirits Together was also tailored specifically for the rural context and delivery in the church setting um, through an iterative community-based treatment development process. Um, so for those of you who have, again, um, we have a lot of practitioners on today, I just wanted to give a sense of the overview of the sessions um, that Raising Our Spirits Together um, covers in terms of core CBT concepts. So you can see we are following um, the kind of gold standard evidence-based approach um, by focusing on psychoeducation, then moving into behavioral activation, which again, we do not use that jargon or kind of that more academic terminology. We talk about it as the importance of taking action. Then we move into cognitive restructuring, which we call identifying negative thoughts and replacing them with more helpful ones, identifying and challenging faulty beliefs. Then we focus a session on problem solving before focusing on and wrapping up um, and having some closure with a program review and relapse prevention. So I wanted to be able to show a bit of the platform. Um, so this is the landing page for Raising Our Spirits Together. Um, and our community partners were involved in helping us select um, and identifying images, text, quotes, case examples, vignettes to incorporate to make this relevant and acceptable to rural populations. Um, and, and I should say the rural population in, in their community. Um, and then again, um, facilitate engagement with the treatment. Um, this is an example of one of the tailorable um, or customizable slides where we use a quote and in Raising Our Spirits Together, um, our community partners identified scripture um, since clergy is delivering and leading our treatment um, that connects with the content. So this scripture connects with um, content for session four, which is when we're just beginning to introduce cognitive restructuring and specifically the importance of identifying negative thoughts. Um, so now I'd love to show a little clip of what folks see um, when they're getting some of the educational content in session four. Um, and really this clip shows you um, what folks see as we're making the transition from talking about the importance of taking action to talking about the importance of, of kind of keeping an eye on um, those negative thoughts. We've been learning a lot about how taking action can help us feel better. Billy's been doing a great job with taking action too. She made it to the reunion, even though she wasn't sure she felt like going. But taking action is just one part of CBT, what we call the behavioral part. We need to keep in mind that depression is connected to our thinking, too. Remember when we first learned about CBT? We saw that CBT is based on the connection between our actions, thoughts, and feelings. Now we're working to some time learning some tools to help us with our thinking, or the cognitive part of CBT. When we feel down, we have more negative thoughts. Our negative thoughts are often about ourselves, our current situation, or our future. We've been learning a lot about how take. I'm sorry, I have to just get us to the us next feel. slide instead of um, that. All right, so now I'd like to just show you a little bit of Billy. And I have to tell you, so when we were working with our community partners and the research team and the developers, we weren't sure how people were, what people were going to think about, you know, an animated character being part of this. Were folks going to connect or were people going to, you know, really kind of push back? And so this was really a risk we felt in terms of, you know, understanding this. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time in our pilot work getting input from folks. Um, and again, this is our first version um, of this intervention. And so we have a lot of plans on ways in which we can expand um, storylines, characters, so that additional, you know, addition, um, identities and positionalities can um, be 
brought to bear through um, our characters and storylines. But this is one of my favorite clips from the entire um, story that folks engage with and experience when they're going through Raising Our Spirits together. And it is when Billy, our main character, is um, making a decision to go to a high school reunion that she was invited to. It's one of her main behavioral activation goals. Um, and so she gets there, um, but she's having a lot of negative thoughts about what might happen. And we see what she experiences and a little bit of how she might deal with that. Well, if it isn't Sherry Sunshine. Hi, it's so great to see you, Jackie. Oh my God, it's Sherry Sunshine. Wait till I tell Grace. Who is Sherry Sunshine? I'm surprised you don't already know. She was a pretty popular balloon back in school, always inflated, always floating through life, like, you know, like balloons are meant to. Sherry always had a lot of friends. She was fun to be around, funny, kind, happy. Nothing like how I was in these situations. Next. Oh, great. I recognized the balloon working the desk right away, Tanya Thompson. She lived two houses down from mine growing up. I used to give her rides to school sometimes. Hey, Tanya. Long time no see, huh? Oh, uh, yeah. Are you here from catering? Because I can show you where Linda needs you. No, no, Tanya. It's me, Billy. Billy Miller from Evergreen Street. Oh, hi. I'm so sorry. Are you here for the reunion? She did not remember me. Yep. Great, great, great. Let me get your name tag. You said Bobby, right? Mm, Billy. I'm so sorry, Bobby. It seems we don't have a name tag for you. Of course she didn't remember me. Who would? I'm so forgettable and never really connected with anyone. Oh, oh okay. Maybe I... Um, classic Billy. At that point, I wanted to deflate myself and hide under the table. I didn't care that Jerry asked me to come or that I promised to help with cleanup. I almost left right then and there. Hmm. Did you RSVP? Yes, I think so. Jerry asked me to come and... Oh, great. He must have forgotten to tell us to look for you. We'll get you a name tag. Sorry, Bobby. We ran out of white tags. Billy. Oh, whoops. Billy. There. Sorry about the confusion. Have a good time. Go Wildcats. It was too late to turn back. It was pretty overwhelming. Like, nightmare overwhelming. So many faces that I remembered and, in a way, wanted to talk to, but plenty of unfamiliar faces and a couple of balloons that I wanted to completely avoid. Everyone had formed groups. Old sports teams, band kids, whatever. It was all too much. Part of me said, let's go. Part of me wanted to hide out in the bathroom. I felt like I couldn't move for risk of making a fool of myself, but I did. Hey, hey, were you, are you? No, I'm not. Miss Donnelly's algebra two? Last row, you used to give me answers on our quizzes. Me? I can't read your tag. Billy, that's it. Uh, yes. I think I was in that class. Ha! I knew it. You used to date that guy, Johnny, right? Uh, well... I was just talking to him at the bar. What a story about his time in the Air Force. He just got back to town a couple of months ago. He's gonna want to say hi. He's here now? Yep. Corner table. I'm sorry. I, I gotta... Christina? From chemistry? My head? Yeah, my head was not in a good place at that moment. I was thinking, they are having so much fun. Everyone has friends here. Everyone belongs. You know, the usual. I looked at Johnny and thought, don't go over there. You know what will happen. He doesn't want to talk to you. You're a nobody. Some stuff like that. Nothing helped me feel any better. I was this close to ditching the whole reunion, but... You know, I had set this goal of talking to Johnny, so I don't know. I kept going. 
So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an idea of what folks see um, when they're engaging with the intervention. And then also we are able to tailor some of the examples. So this is a, just another way in which we, um, with our community partners, really thought about some common faulty beliefs that are driving thinking errors. And so what came up a lot of for the, our community partners is the idea of I must never ask for help. Um, and also I, nev I must never appear weak. So being able to integrate um, some, some beliefs that come up very commonly in the rural setting specifically with other very common faulty beliefs that are more general. We have the opportunity to really easily modify and customize um, intervention content to be as relevant as possible for folks engaging with the program. Um, and so I just want to talk a little bit about how things have been going for us so far. So we were able to start a pilot project um, in our um, partner community in Hillsdale in February 2020. And so you can imagine, um, you know, that that wasn't the best time to be starting a pilot. And I should mention at that time we were doing this in person. So folks were coming together at um, the church one of our partner churches, the clergy was leading the small group study, the computer um, piece of it would be on a TV screen, everybody would be kind of sitting together in a room, have their workbook in front of them, um, you know, kind of pausing the screen to do um, interactive exercises, kind of going back and forth, having the leader, um, you know, kind of do some rapport building, facilitation, um, and it was really working great. And then three sessions in, um, COVID happened, and we could no longer safely gather together. Um, so we worked really um, quickly to engage with our community partners, the clergy leading groups, the participants in the pilot, because we felt a strong ethical obligation that we had identified folks who, you know, were experiencing depression, who were interested in treatment. They had gotten partway through. We really felt we needed to find a way to continue. So we were able to move everything online and deliver the treatment, raising our spirits together through Zoom. So just like I shared intervention content with you today, that's exactly how group leaders are sharing the intervention content with participants. Um, and so that's how we completed our pilot. So we completed the first group and held a second pilot group that way. Um, and we've moved forward with a larger randomized control trial following that same model. Um, and so what I really wanted to highlight are two key areas of findings that we're really encouraged by. Um, one is that we're seeing a clinically and statistically significant decrease in um, pilot participants' depressive symptom scores over time in the intervention. And so you can see before the intervention at baseline, the average depression score was about a 14.3. And so for some of you who may use the patient health questionnaire nine or PHQ nine in your work, you may know that a score of 10 or above indicates probable major depressive disorder. So this was a group that was definitely in that, you know, solidly in that moderately depressed range, probably dealing with major depressive disorder. At the end of the treatment, um, we reassessed folks and their PHQ-9 score was on average 6.3, which is no longer um, hitting that probable MDD range. So we were very excited um, to see that. And um, we saw that that treatment effect was maintained through that three-month follow-up. We also saw that participants really were engaged as we would as we had hoped, and they um, attended an average of 7.3 of the eight sessions. And so as a result, we're now recruiting more broadly um, for a larger RCT, a randomized controlled trial, um, because it's really important that we're able to adequately evaluate um, the treatment to make sure it's working as intended before we more broadly distribute. Again, the intervention is completely delivered via Zoom. Um, so this just gives a little bit of a schematic of the current study design. I'm going to skip over that because I know um, I've been a bit over on time. So if you're interested in more information about Raising Our Spirits Together or about a recent publication on our pilot work, um, please feel free to reach out. We would love to talk more. Um, and we'll do some questions later. Just want to acknowledge and thank um, the study team that works with us day in, day out to make this possible, the participants, 
um, who are really sharing feedback and it's so valuable to work with on this study, the National Institute of Mental Health for funding and mentors um, on that funding um, through the National Institute of Health, uh, Mental Health. And so really appreciate again, being able to share this with you all today and would now like to um, turn the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Lindsay Bornheimer. Thank you so much, Addy. And I will just now go through sharing my screen. Um, Addy, I think it's, it's nice that we are um, together in this presentation because I am also focused on tailoring a cognitive behavioral intervention. So I think that there is some wonderful overlap there. So I hope everyone can see my slides and um, I am Lindsay Bornheimer. I'm gonna be presenting on the adaptation of a suicide prevention treatment for adults with psychosis. And I am going to actually start us off with a poll. So I know um, hopefully we're not all polled out, uh, but here we are with the poll. And the question is, which of the following is not a schizophrenia spectrum disorder in the DSM-5? So um, schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or delusional disorder. Which one is not a schizophrenia spectrum disorder? And the DSM-5 is the newer version. And we're just going to wait for a couple moments, make sure that we get everyone's answers. Okay, so schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or delusional disorder. Let's see what we're finding. Okay, great. So hopefully everyone can see this. So bipolar disorder is not a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. We're not going to go through all of the different disorders, but I just wanted to start us off. Um, and here's our slide that shows us. I just wanted to start us off. So we're somewhat on the same page. And of course, one can have uh, symptoms of psychosis when they, they have bipolar disorder, but it is not technically uh, a part of the, the uh, group of, of diagnoses in the DSM. So that is wonderful. We're going to do another poll. We are starting our, our time off here with polls. Um, so in comparison to the general population, the suicide rate for individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, that's what SSD is, is the same, higher, or lower. So in comparison to the general population, schizophrenia spectrum disorders have a suicide rate that is the same, higher, or lower. So we'll just wait just a moment, make sure that everyone can get in their answer in. And I see some people put it in the chat, which is definitely a great place to go if the poll's not working. And I think we are about ready to see our results. Great. So we're seeing the, the majority are saying higher, which is true. And that's what we're going to learn about uh, here in just a minute. Uh, so this is an important foundation for where we're going. Thank you for voting. And let's learn more about this. So suicide is a leading cause of premature death. And I know we've been hearing uh, a lot about this today in, in these lectures. And for individuals with psychiatric diagnosis who die by suicide, mood and schizophrenia spectrum disorders are among the most frequent. And comparison to the general population, suicide rates are higher for individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders and also for people who have symptoms of psychosis. So not necessarily meeting criteria for um, the diagnosis. And schizophrenia spectrum disorders decrease longevity by about 10 years with suicide in much of the research being the largest contributor to uh, such decrease. So we're seeing here that this is a major public health problem and risk is actually uh, even higher. So I'm saying it's higher than the general population for people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, but is actually even higher in the first year of diagnosis. So that is a whole other area of uh, research, but just know that 
um, it is it is definitely higher than among uh, the general population and in comparison to many other uh, diagnoses. So much attention in the literature has really been focused on depression and hopelessness in relation to suicide. And I think we all um, know a lot about that. We know that it's, um, you know, in the media or in the news or in, in movies, we hear a lot about um, stories where there's depression and hopelessness. But those experiences are not always common for people experiencing um, symptoms of psychosis or having a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. So um, much of our screening tools and our intervention approaches um, really focus on symptoms of depression and hopelessness. And um, this population is just one example of um, you know, um, an area where that may not all be applicable or meaningful. So I've spent my, my career so far really focusing on psychosis symptomatology and experiences of individuals who have symptoms of psychosis in relation to suicide risk. So um, I've been looking at positive symptoms of psychosis. So thinking about how hallucinations and delusions might create um, instances where there's increased risk. Then negative symptoms of psychosis, you might be familiar um, with, with negative symptoms, mostly relating to effective flattening and, and social withdrawal. And interestingly, and there's actually um, a lot of mixed literature on the topic. So there are some uh, studies that show negative symptoms are a risk factor for suicide. And there are other studies that show it's protective. So the protective piece is actually interesting. And I think there's more that we need to learn about this. Um, and some of it relates to the ability to engage in um, thinking, planning, or potentially carrying out um, plans for suicide. And then lastly, I spent a lot of time looking at and considering the role of distress related to symptomatology. And I think actually this really matters when I talked about risk being uh, exceptionally high in the first year after diagnosis. Distress plays a really large role. So um, in addition to that, the experience of um, feeling defeated, feeling trapped, particularly in relation to positive symptoms, and then having beliefs or feelings that there's no rescue. And much of that uh, really relates to um, support. So despite all of this literature about risk factors and protective factors, there's really an absence of evidence-based interventions with that specific tailoring for symptoms of psychosis, which is what I've been focusing on in my work. So uh, bringing us to CBT, um, and we've learned a bit from Addie um, about CBT. So it is well established um, in the treatment of mental illness. We know that CBT for psychosis uh, is wonderful. I've used it a lot, but it doesn't target suicide risk. And then CBT for suicide prevention is also wonderful, but it's not tailored for people who experience symptoms of psychosis. So Cognitive behavioral suicide prevention for psychosis is a more recently developed um, treatment. It's still pretty preliminary. Um, it was developed in the United Kingdom. And because it's such a long name, I will um, refer to it often as CBSPP, which is also um, feels like a lot of letters to say. Um, but this treatment targets three cognitive mechanisms involved in suicide thoughts and behavior. So information processing biases, appraisals, and schema. And everything is tailored for psychosis symptomatology. So when we talk about suicide risk, um, when we talk about defeat, uh, everything is tailored to symptomatology. But despite promising results, the treatment really requires some modification before it goes into the U.S. public mental health system because it was developed in the UK. So as for modification, some of the things that I've been wanting to adapt fall into three overarching categories. So I'll talk us through them. So first is increasing the feasibility of provider training. So we know provider time is limited. We have many providers here with us today. Um, prior uh, studies of CBSPP has, have shown that um, providers said that the, the training was you know, very time consuming and not as feasible. So my hope has been to make it more feasible by developing a hybrid remote and on-demand training. 
Um, and along with that, I wanted to develop a supervision protocol and booster training protocol that is equally feasible. So um, also on demand and online. The second area is thinking about enhancing client engagement. Um, and Addie touched upon some of this as well, particularly thinking about engagement um, with CBT. But data show that most individuals with schizophrenia spectrum disorders don't receive treatment. There's limited access to services. We definitely see that. We know there's low levels of engagement and it's well established that low treatment engagement is a predictor of suicide. So I propose to develop um, weekly engaging videos that are inspired by Entertain Me Well, not as sophisticated, but they're inspired. Um, and, and it's for clients to watch between session. And um, the goal is it for it to be supportive and boost the treatment content um, so that there's more continue, continu continuity uh, between sessions. And then the second piece is developing text messages that can be sent to clients as well. So again, supportive statements and reinforcing the treatment. And the last area is really focusing on ways that we can improve the treatment content and its delivery. So when it was developed in the UK, it was developed to be 24 weeks long. Um, and many of us may know as clinicians, that is not, that's not always feasible um, or, or sustainable in practice. So my plan is to reduce it from 24 weeks to 10. I also wanted to add safety planning um, because we know how valuable safety planning can be. I wanted to add the use of coping cards and um, it was developed by psychologists. And as a social worker, I really wanted there to be more of an ecological focus um, in the comprehensive suicide risk assessment. So all of this has been the foundation of my current NIMH study focused on modifying and testing CBSPP to increase its effectiveness and implementation in community mental health. So I'm going to be telling you a little bit about what we've done in our AIM-1, which is all about modification. So our approach to modification involves community-based participatory research methods, and schizophrenia spectrum disorder populations are often marginalized, stigmatized, face many barriers to treatment, and experience health disparities at greater rates than individuals who don't have schizophrenia spectrum disorders. So I really wanted to collaborate with stakeholders as community partners in making modifications. With my experience, of course, I could um, you know, come up with ideas of what might be better, but I just really wanted to include the voices of people who would deliver the treatment and or um, receive the treatment. So we have shared power in our team and our goal is just to collectively improve and deliver this suicide prevention treatment. So in AIM-1, when I talk about modification, what are we doing? So we have collected and analyzed mixed method stakeholder data of about 25 adults. Um, they are clients, providers, and peer advocates at Washtenaw County Community Health. So I know I mentioned clients and providers, but we also wanted to add the voices of consumer advocates, um, individuals who were working in community mental health and have lived experience um, and a lot with schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Uh, so everyone, um, all of the clients met criteria for having a schizophrenia spectrum disorder. They had recent uh, suicide ideation or made an attempt. So again, we wanted to work with the people who might be receiving this treatment. Um, so we collected data in a survey uh, and then uh, conducted qualitative interviews after telling everyone about the treatment. And our hope was to learn about the need for this treatment um, what people thought about the hybrid training, barriers that might get in the way, um, areas that we could make improvements. So uh, we, we had our qualitative interviews and analyzed our data in deduce. And after that, we gained input from uh, a panel of scholarly experts in the fields of suicide, psychosis, intervention and implementation science research. And they helped us interpret our stakeholder um, data. So as a group of experts, they helped us interpret um, our findings and they also gave additional modifications, um, suggestions that were really helpful. And ultimately, all together, we engaged in collaborative decision-making for modifications to the treatment manual, training manuals, and also the delivery protocol. So, 
As for our results of, of, of these stakeholder um, data, we, we found that stakeholders agreed that suicide is a problem and that CBSPP is needed. Um, and several people cited suicides that happened recently at community mental health. Uh, many providers talked about uh, a lack of training uh, in suicide prevention with a specific focus on psychosis. All stakeholders like the ideas of our hybrid provider training and our client engagement enhancers. On the next slide, you'll see more barriers, concerns, and recommendations. But I wanted to first put here some powerful quotes that I, I just think um, are so meaningful. They're from each of the stakeholder groups. And because of time, I was just going to summarize a bit of them. But you can see uh, a client is sharing in the first quote about thinking that nothing was going to help. And the study came along and gave them a chance to talk, even when they didn't want to, um, and, and that the project gave them a chance. And then just jumping to the bottom, Providers shared um, what one provider shared that much of the evidence based studies focus on chronic suicide risk and the general population, and just speaking to how it's very difficult to adapt that for psychosis. And what I really like is they gave um, a specific example of wanting to know uh, what to do when a triggering event is a hallucination. Um, and overall, the fact that there's just really an absence um, with a focus on, on this. So, in our treatment, we talk a lot about um, triggering events events and um, th this provider would definitely get what they need when it comes to uh, understanding more of that. So moving forward with the results and moving towards um, the, the more barriers, I guess we could say, we, we received many, many um, uh, comments and wonderful responses to our questions. We had the emergence of many themes of uh, all the questions that we asked. And uh, we have about five tables that I, I couldn't show today. They are um, in a manuscript under review. And I just want to highlight a couple of overarching things um, and all in relation to questions that we asked about feasibility and sustainability. So a logistic challenge has emerged, and this is not going to be surprising. An example was high caseloads, which make a new treatment really challenging. So for providers to learn something new and then deliver something new, get supervision, more training, um, you know, it really becomes a logistical issue. Then perceptual challenges emerge across all stakeholder groups as well. So um, an example being motivation to learn, deliver, or for a client to receive a treatment. So um, you can see that there's other examples on the slide as well. Um, but a lot of that moves towards buy-in as well. And then clinical um, challenges emerged too, and we anticipated this. And one example being uh, psychosis acuity fluctuations and how that might impact the treatment. So, you know, we, we can do our training, we can say this is the manual and this is what we do, uh, but I think that people wanted to know more about um, how we make adaptations in real time uh, when we're faced with different levels of acuity. And I think that's such, such an important um, piece of feedback. So as for modifications, and this is kind of our, our big slide of all of the recommendations and what has funneled down to um, where we are in, in our um, in, in our phase of this study. So you can see in the top row is where I proposed in the grant application along with other investigators for what we would modify. It's everything I've already spoke about. And then below you can see there's stakeholder recommendations and expert panel recommendations. Because of time, I'm just gonna pick out a couple of them. There's really a lot in this figure. Um, and I'll say overall, everything pertains to tailoring the treatment manual, the protocol, making providers provider training more feasible, and enhancing client engagement. So um, two things from the stakeholder area is a focus on more um, client self-esteem and bolstering social support. And then one thing I'll lift out of the expert panel area that I just think was such a good point is adding content and training um, in the manual about suicide intent. So thinking about individuals, um, and I've experienced this in, in my many years of practice, um, but individuals who make an attempt or die by suicide, uh, and they may be responding to, say, a command auditory hallucination, so there may not be intent uh, of wanting to die. So I think that was a really important point.
So I'm just going to show you here the uh, a little screenshot of what the training looks like. You can see that it is all, um, you know, a bunch of modules and there's a screenshot of me presenting in a video. It's very small, but you can see all of the 10 weeks of treatment and I'm happy to, you know, respond to any questions about that, certainly at the end. The next thing to show is, uh, I mentioned we had some influence from Entertain Me Well and these are our engagement in enhancing videos. So this is Andre. Um, all of the clients follow Andre throughout the course of treatment. There are 10 videos that coincide with treatment. And we see Andre go through uh, the treatment process. We see him do well and we see him face challenges. And um, it, it's really, really exciting for, for clients to, to have this as well. So in conclusion, um, you know, consistent with previous literature, stakeholders noted the importance of champions among leadership. I mean, we know a lot about this in implementation science. We, we know uh, about provider and organizational buy-in, um, and we know that providers need to be really supported when they're rolling um, out a new treatment. We also learned a lot, and we knew some of this going in, that technology access would be a very large barrier. Um, so we're working on trying to address that. Provider preparation and support and engagement they are all really important implication areas for research and practice. And we felt that CBPR methods were really valuable and essential um, for what we did in modifying this treatment, particularly because our population faces stigma, marginalization, health disparities, and low service utilization rates. So as our next steps, we are going to be testing the intervention. So I've told you today about what we've modified. We're moving towards testing the intervention. So you can see here, there's a little flow chart of um, what that looks like. And I will be excited to report on what we learned from uh, that next step. And thank you so much for uh, listening, for being here. I'd like to acknowledge our funder, the NIMH, our community stakeholder collaborators at Washtenaw County Community Mental Health. I also listed all of our team's information on the left-hand side and two email addresses in case anyone wants to reach out or learn more. So thank you so much for your time and interest in this work. This is great. Terrific to see all this amazing work. Uh, we now want to get to the questions as quickly as possible. I'll say two or three things. I will say it, it warms my heart to, to see uh, so many uh, folks at our school working in interventions from macro to micro and in between. Uh, social work pr practitioners deliver most of the direct practice in mental health, the direct service in mental health, but we haven't been as engaged in the intervention research, how to design interventions. So what we're really seeing here is there's a social work thread throughout, and that is we're working on access gaps, engagement and interest gaps, and even effectiveness gaps, and trying to bring in lots of voices, community voices, participants, uh, people who are affected with the problems, and community members to try to close some of these access, interest, and effectiveness gaps and make uh, mental health service more equal and available to everyone. It's, it's super inspiring. I think we should move quickly to some uh, questions. Emma, do you have one that you'd like to be, uh, me to begin with or should I just uh, start where I think I should start? Let's go ahead and start with the Q&A box. Q&A box, okay. So this one I think is for you, Dr. Watkins, I think. Yes, uh, what is the uh, um, number one cause of, cause of death among black males, white males, Hispanic males? Uh -huh. yes. Well, in the interest of time, I'll answer really quickly. The, uh, Number three, the three top causes of death for Black men, uh, the first is heart disease, the second is cancer, the third is unintentional injuries. Okay, good. And are you going to expand the YB Men Project to other states, do you think? That is the plan, right? But we need resources. And so we're always seeking funding. We're writing grants. We're uh, talking with donors. So yes, I think in a perfect world, we'd love to expand to uh, Black men all across the country. Great. Dr. Wexler, another question. Uh, you have uh, many components to the intervention in that beautiful slide uh, with the house there that was present. Just curious as to if you can give our, our listeners, our, our participants, a little sense of what do you think are some of the major, most important elements on that, on that slide? Great question. Preventing, uh, preventing some of the, suicide. Yeah, some of the other questions that were asked that were just easy answers, I put them in the the question and answer box, but firearms is the biggest um, 
mechanism or method for suicide. And in Alaska, that means that about 60% of the suicide deaths are done by firearm. And in the lower 48, as we call this part of the U.S., it's about 50%. More people die by gun suicide than other kinds of violent means. So if I had to pick one thing and only one thing, it would be securing home firearms. We understand that they're really important sometimes for subsistence and food, particularly for the people that I work with. Um, but it's also really important to make sure that they're safely stored. Next one, I'll ask uh, Dr. Weaver, uh, what are we doing to try to help with uh, the access to the, what about people who don't have access to uh, the internet devices and the like? How, how's that been working out for you and your work? Yes, thank you. I really appreciate that. That's an excellent question. And one of the reasons we initially had planned on bringing folks together in person and with the, in the context of COVID, it's been very interesting because within our pilot study and our RCT to date, we have not had to turn anyone away um, because they don't have access to technology. Um, we were also planning to be able to um, provide devices if needed that has not come up. Um, so I think for us, it's also an open question um, as to what would happen if we were in the UP, for instance, rather than in Southeastern Michigan in rural communities and how we may need to think differently about the way the intervention um, can be disseminated. And I think now we, know, we, we feel like we could offer in person or virtual, um, and we had never really thought about offering it virtually before. Um, so I think that that led to a new opportunity, um, and we really will follow community lead moving forward. Great, thank you. Um, I have another question. This is for Dr. Bornheimer off of the uh, off of the panel here. Um, since so many people with psychosis have substance use disorders, I'm assuming this also plays a role in suicide for them not to mention homelessness. Absolutely, um, and, and that's a really great point. So uh, substance uh, use disorders are definitely a piece of the puzzle. Um, I think that, you know, I think we always think about uh, what comes first and, and certainly it's a little bit of one of those bi-directional relationships. So um, it's certainly something that we would want to assess for and be mindful of. Um, we know that on its own substance use um, disorders also relate to suicide risk. So it's almost, um, you know, a little extra concerning when we put two, two things together um, that relate to potentially increased risk. And of course, there are other factors too, like you mentioned, homelessness. And I think that, you know, those are a lot of pieces of the puzzle that we have to consider beyond just a diagnosis or beyond just uh, symptomatology. So I would agree that those are um, really important points. And part of my, um, what I've added as our um, comprehensive suicide assessment that really has an ecological focus taps into more of those aspects. Um, and I, I really like that too, because I feel like um, it's better when we think about um, stigma and not wanting to perpetuate some of the stigma that is experienced. So if we can shift some of our focus from symptomatology onto something like, you know, how is homelessness uh, impacting the individual or uh, resulting in added stress or um, challenges, then I think that's much more of a healthy place to be. So that's definitely something we integrate in the treatment. And I appreciate your um, naming that. We have one final really good question here in the middle of the Q&A. Don't want to miss it. This one's for Dr. Watkins. Uh, do you know what accounts for the high participant participation rate for the YB Men Project? Uh, and is confidentiality, confidentiality less or more of a concern among younger participants? Oh, fantastic questions. I'll answer the second part first. So one of the things that we do in the private social media groups is we allow the guys to have avatars and to come up with fake names so that they can truly express themselves in whatever ways they feel comfortable. And I think that does add a level of um, safety and confidentiality. In terms of the high participation rates, you know, I would love to say that it's you know, because it's an exciting project and because it's social media based and they can access it right from their cell phones. Um, and I think all of those components actually contribute to the high participation rates. We also use a lot of pop culture references. And so the things that they're talking about with their friends and their family, music, movies, 
you know, we definitely present all that information in the intervention as well. And so I think if I had to guess, I think those are the reasons why we've had a lot of success. Great. I'm mindful of our time. Could not have been more excited uh, to see these talks and to hear all this great stuff. I'm sure we could go on well into the evening, uh, but to see these uh, social work academics leading these intervention projects in the area of mental health in critical areas like depression and suicide is inspirational to me and to all of us, I'm sure. Thank you all so much for uh, coming. 160 or so people uh, came to this uh, webinar today, and I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we hope you have a great evening. And uh, enjoy the 100th anniversary slide at the University of Michigan. <laughs>